Now, let's review the different cells of the immune system. First, let's discuss innate and adaptive immunity. These are important concepts in understanding the immune system. In particular, as we discuss different disease processes, try to think about which branch of the immune system is predominant in guiding the body's response to disease. Innate immunity is encoded in the germline. The response of the innate immune system is fast and nonspecific, which allows rapid combat against certain pathogens. However, there's no memory to the innate immune system, which means each pathogen is experienced for the first time, every time. Know the components of innate immunity, macrophages, dendritic cells, NK cells, and complement. NK cells are the only lymphocyte member of the innate immune system. Adaptive immunity, on the other hand, develops in response to exposure to pathogens. During lymphocyte development, exposure to antigens facilitates VDJ recombination, which we'll discuss later, which allows for a more specific response. The advantage of adaptive immunity, in spite of its initially slower response, is the fact that memory develops, allowing for faster and more robust immunologic responses to subsequent exposures. The adaptive immune system consists of T cells, B cells, and circulating antibodies. We've mentioned the concept of antigen-presenting cells several times already in this lecture. Now let's discuss just how certain cells present antigens. MHC refers to the major histocompatibility complex. These molecules, of which there are two types, 1 and 2, are encoded for by the human leukocyte antigen genes. It's important and high yield to understand the differences between MHC1 and MHC2. Let's look at these another way in this table. MHC1 is encoded for by the HLA A, B, and C genes and is expressed on almost all nucleated cells. Can you think of a cell type that doesn't express MHC1? That's right, red blood cells are non-nucleated and hence do not express this molecule. MHC1 typically presents antigen from intracellular pathogens as the primary mediator of viral immunity. The MHC antigen complex binds the T-cell receptor on CD8 cells, thus stimulating immunologic response to viruses. MHC2, on the other hand, is encoded for by the HLA DR, DP, and DQ genes and is expressed only on antigen-presenting cells and typically mediates immunity to bacterial infection. This is actually quite a high-yield topic and it's worth spending some time remembering. I won't read them all for you, but you should look over them yourself. Natural killer cells are the only lymphocytes in the innate immune system. They use perforin and granzymes to induce apoptosis of virally infected cells and tumor cells. The activity of these lymphocytes is enhanced by IL-12, interferon beta, and interferon alpha. Knowing the major functions of B and T cells will make your understanding of the adaptive immune system much more fluid. When you hear antibody, think B cells. This cell line is involved in producing antibody and mediating allergy, cytotoxic and immune complex hypersensitivity, and hyperacute organ rejection. We'll hold our discussion of B cells until later, focusing now on T cell differentiation and activation and function. T cells are involved in cell-mediated immunity. Let's review these in more detail on the next slide. T cell precursors are produced in the bone marrow, after which they undergo positive and negative selection of the thymus. Under the influence of positive selection of the thymic cortex, T cell precursors are selected on the basis of their expression of CD4 and CD8. Negative selection of the medulla results in differential selection of either CD4 positive or CD8 positive T cells. At this point, T cells migrate to the lymph node where they're presented with an antigen. Here, CD8 cells, under the influence of the appropriate co-stimulatory signals, assume the role of cytotoxic T cells that kill virally infected neoplastic and donor graft cells by inducing apoptosis. CD4 T cells, or helper T cells, under the influence of either IL-12 or IL-4, differentiate into Th1 or Th2 cells respectively. We'll discuss the functions of each subtype of T cell shortly. This is a complex topic, but fortunately can be simplified on the basis of various cell surface markers. For the purposes of step one, it's definitely worth remembering these markers. We've mentioned antigen-presenting cells several times. Classic antigen-presenting cells include macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. Recall that T cells are either helper or cytotoxic. For helper T cell activation, a foreign body is phagocytosed by the antigen-presenting cell and presented to the T helper cell via MHC2. This is signal one. Next, B7 on the antigen-presenting cell interacts with CD28 on the T cell and serves as the second co-stimulatory signal. A similar process exists in the activation of cytotoxic T cells. In this situation, endogenously synthesized proteins are presented via MHC1. The interaction between this complex and the T cell receptor, or TCR, is signal number one. Signal two involves the activation of cytotoxic T cells via IL-2, which is produced by T helper cells. Remember our discussion of the interplay between T helper cells and other lymphocytes? B cell class switching also requires two signals. 
Th2 cells produce either IL-4, IL-5, or IL-6 in response to antigen exposure. When B cells are acted upon by any of these cytokines, this is signal 1. Signal 2 is the interaction between the CD40 receptor on the B cell and the CD40 ligand on T helper cells. Generally the helper T cell that's activating a B cell was itself just activated by that same B cell since B cells act as antigen presenting cells. Here it's worth bringing up the topic of energy because it highlights the importance of the co-stimulatory signal. Energy describes the phenomenon whereby self-reactive T cells are rendered non-reactive due to the fact that they are not exposed to the appropriate co-stimulatory molecule. You can certainly understand the implications of the body producing T cells that might be activated against the body's own tissues. As previously mentioned, CD4 positive T cells have the fate of becoming either T helper 1 or T helper 2 cells. Th1 cells are responsible for regulating the cell mediated response to infection. Through the secretion of IL2 and interferon gamma, Th1 cells activate macrophages in CD8 cells. Th2 cells regulate the humoral response. As such, which cell type are Th2 cells helpful to? You're right if you guess B cells. The secretion of IL-4 and 5 stimulates B cells to make antibody. Th2 cells also produce IL-10, which has counter-regulatory effects on Th1 cells. Likewise, interferon gamma from Th1 cells inhibits the action of Th2 cells. By now, hopefully, you're beginning to appreciate the complex and delicate interplay among the many components of the immune system. We've mentioned these in several other sections, but again briefly, cytotoxic CD8-positive T cells are responsible for destruction of infected, neoplastic, or otherwise disordered cells. They kill these cells by releasing proteins that puncture the cell membrane, as well as activate the apoptotic cascade. They have CD8 on their surfaces, which binds to the MHC1s of infected cells. Later on in first aid, you'll see a wide variety of autoimmune diseases that all wreak havoc with multiple organ systems, sometimes simultaneously, due to misdirection of the body's normal immune response. Regulatory T cells help keep this from happening by suppressing unwanted immune activity. They do this by suppressing the CD4 and CD8 T cell functions via anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10 and TGF-beta. Let's shift our discussion now to the topic of B cells and their major action, production of antibody. Recall that B cells, under various influences, including help from helper T cells, are responsible for the humoral immune response. These humors are antibodies. First, let's break down the structure of the antibody. Each antibody consists of two heavy and two light chains, each of which has a variable amino terminal and a fixed or constant carboxy terminal. It's the variable part of the antibody that recognizes antigens and confers specificity to the antigenic response. The constant, or FC, portion of the antibody determines its isotype, such as IgG or IgA, and is also responsible for the fixation of complement in certain isotypes. We'll speak more on different isotypes momentarily. In the lower part of this fact, you can see some of the functions of antibodies. Opsonization is when a pathogen is coated with antibodies. Neutralization is when antibodies prevent their targets from carrying out their normal functions. And lastly, antibodies play a role in activating the complement cascade. Another function, which isn't shown here, is that antibodies are sometimes not secreted, but remain on the cell membranes of B cells. Cross-linking membrane antibodies can initiate intracellular signaling pathways leading to B cell activation, and phagocytosis of pathogens stuck to the B cell via its membrane antibodies is required for antigen presentation on MHC2 molecules. An important concept to understand is how antibody diversity is generated. Remember that antibodies are very specific to antigen exposure. This is further important when memory B cells are induced to produce a robust antibody response to re-exposure to previously encountered antigens. There are several ways in which antibody diversity is generated. Random recombination of VJ or VDJ genes that encode for both heavy and light chains, random combination of heavy chains and light chains, somatic hypermutation following antigen stimulation, and finally, addition of nucleotides to DNA during recombination. Of these, VDJ recombination and somatic hypermutation are most important. There are five different immunoglobulin isotypes, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgD, and IgE. Understanding the different functions is quite high yield. All mature B cells express both IgM and IgD. When these cells further differentiate into plasma cells, they're capable of secreting IgA, IgE, and IgG. IgG is the most abundant isotype. It's capable of crossing the placenta, thus providing infants with passive immunity. IgA exists in either a monomer or a dimer, and it's importantly found in secretions. IgM is involved in the immediate response to an antigen, and exists as either a monomer or a pentamer. IgE binds mast cells and basophils. Through cross-linking upon exposure to allergens, it mediates hypersensitivity. It also mediates immunity to helminths or worms and activates eosinophils.
We've discussed the concept of antigenic memory and the types of cells involved in creating this memory. Now let's understand the process of developing the memory. Antigens are either thymus dependent or thymus independent. Thymus independent antigens lack a peptide component and cannot be presented to T cells. These antigens are only able to stimulate the release of IgM and cannot induce immunologic memory. This is because the MHC2 complex is only able to present peptide antigens and this is required to activate T cells. Thymus dependent antigens, on the other hand, do have a protein component, thus allowing presentation via MHC. When these antigens are presented to the appropriate cells, they induce a rapid and robust response that is specific to the antigen. Another concept to understand as we discuss the development of memory is the difference between active and passive immunity. Active immunity is induced after exposure to foreign antigens. This is the process of immunologic memory we've discussed. Vaccines rely on the development of immunologic memory to offer protection against certain bacteria and viruses. Passive immunity, on the other hand, involves the receipt of preformed antibodies. Preformed antibodies to tetanus toxin, botulinum toxin, HPV, and rabies can offer protection upon exposure to these agents. Similarly, newborns rely on the IgA and breast milk to confer passive immunity during the first six weeks of life, while their own innate immunity is still developing.